All right, everyone, thank you for calling in and welcome to the Consumer Energy Alliance webinar series. We are very pleased to, to welcome John Heimlich, Vice President and Chief Economist with Airlines for America to give an overview of the airline industry, uh, plans for the future, what this means uh, from a, a travel and tourism and business perspective. John has been a longtime board member of Consumer Energy Alliance, and he is a chairman emeritus of Consumer Energy Alliance, so helped kind of grow the organization over the years. Uh, we are greatly indebted to John for all his service and all that he's done for CEA uh, and all that he's done uh, for Airlines for America. So prior to um, working for A4A, he was at United Airlines. Uh, where he was an economist and worked on uh, routes and supply chains and a whole host of other issues for United. Uh, but he's been with A4A for a number of years, and we couldn't be, ha be happier that John was able to join us today. So, John, uh, the floor is yours. As questions come in, uh, we'll relay them to you. But um, uh, should there be any time left at the end of this discussion, Michael Zare will provide a quick federal update. But John, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions, and we're all anxious to hear what you have to say. So thank you very much for uh, joining us. All right. Got it. Uh, thank you, David. And uh, Ryan, super nice of you. And uh, happy to be with you today. And I think uh, we'll roll through these uh, fairly quickly here. Let's move into it. So we've been collecting data from our uh, member carriers who are providing data once a week, but daily data about their traffic and operations uh, including their regional partners. So it's it's their worldwide operations, everything they brand for seven uh, U.S. passenger airlines. Uh, and the bottom line is that for a couple weeks in a row, we're down 97% year over year in passenger volume. And I can think you can see all those geographic lines converging there in late, late March. Uh, just focus for a moment on the sort of light blue line uh, which you can see started to fall off probably mid to late January. You know, that's the Pacific, North, South, um, you know, Australasia, and uh, of course, China, Korea, Japan, Malaysia, and so forth. So that clearly led the way because, of course, that's where the virus originated. China, then South Korea, then moved its way to Italy, and then uh, so Atlantic then fell. And, but by the time we got to the last few weeks, uh, everything's uh, just down bonkers. So, and that compares to two percent growth, growth year over year in uh, the early part of the year. Uh, so, the carriers have responded, of course, by cutting the number of flights. Uh, this is a seven-day rolling average um, down. The international, of course, was first the first place they cut, and of course. There are a number of, it's not just the U.S. bans on travel, but many foreign uh, governments have banned travel or have some kind of uh, shelter in place, stay at home orders going on and uh, weak economies. So 93% uh, year over year reduction in international and uh, flights and 69% for this group reduction in, in domestic flights. Now, there are some flights that are operating in a cargo only configuration and for uh, American Delta United and Hawaiian Airlines uh, something like 80% of their international flights currently are flying in a cargo only configuration really a really amazing statistic there uh, so this may look similar similar color lines but the consequence of the lower passenger volume and the fewer departures uh, is that the average domestic flight right now, or at least last week, was carrying 12 and a half passengers. The average international flight was carrying 26 passengers. You can see how this compares to the beginning of the year. Uh, it would have been closer to 150 on an international flight and uh, just shy of 100 on a domestic flight. Remember, this includes regional jets and so forth. So um, the point is um, we've reduced departures a lot, but not as much as demand has come down. It takes a while for the capacity to come out of the system. Uh, plus we have certain requirements from the CARES Act uh, legislation that, that 
promulgated so-called minimum air service requirements through DOT, meaning we can't cut as much as we'd like to because they want to keep communities uh, connected to the system. So we're burning incremental cash uh, by, by law, uh, basically, in some cases. Uh, TSA checkpoint volumes, uh, actually, as of today, it's crept up a little bit to like 113,000 uh, per day. Compared, but the key is that a year ago at this time, we would have been looking at 2.3 million travelers, and it could be on a U.S. airline or a foreign flag airline, going through checkpoints. So, um, and look at that little inset box there. Year over year in January, it was up 5.5%. Now we're down 95%. Uh, and it's been that way for quite some time. We don't expect uh, that to look too much better anytime soon, which is a good segue to slide six here uh, with bookings data. So this is uh, the net change year over year in, in booked passenger volumes and net booked revenue. And you might say, well, how could it be down more than 100% in revenue? Well, because these are net bookings it factors new new bookings, sales for future travel, minus refunds for previously booked travel. And we've had many, many weeks in a row where we've had net negative because refunds are exceeding new bookings. So obviously a very um, bad situation to be in uh, and certainly exacerbating our cash crisis with really no money coming in from new sales and people getting cash back from previous bookings. So obviously one of the extreme measures you take is you park aircraft, you idle aircraft. And, you know, the U S passenger airlines in total went into the year with 6,171 active planes in their fleet. Uh, as of, um, I guess Sunday we had idled, 2,965 or 48% of the active fleet is now has now been idle for at least seven days in a row. And that's the, that's the definition we use for this purpose. Uh, if you just looked at a couple days, it would be a higher number, but for at least seven days, you can conclude that they're more or less parked as opposed to in some maintenance check or something. So it's staggering about half the fleet and I get updates on this every two days, and of course, it's been growing steadily. Delta alone said it was going to park 650, and they're in the 500s now, so they're they're not done. Americans punching, uh, parking a bunch, United, et cetera. Everyone is. Uh, and then we have a few small sh airlines shut down completely. Compass Airlines, Transstay, it's Raven Air Alaska. Some fly independently, some regional. Uh, just moving into the fuel implications, of course, a big global reduction in jet fuel demand. So no surprise that uh, jet fuel prices, spot prices have fallen sharply. Um, we love lower prices, but not not when not when it's due to lack of demand for your for your product, which results in lack of demand for the fuel product. Uh, we we had a couple days last week, which uh, we got down to forty four cents. A gallon. Uh, I know no one on this call would ever think it in modern times. You can see how steady it was in the year ago period, fluctuating around two dollars a gallon. But unfortunately, as slide nine shows, we're not really able to take much advantage of that because we're hardly consuming any fuel right now. So uh, this is the EIA data. That's the most real-time data we can get, and of course, this includes military and corporate jets and foreign flags, but on U.S. soil. So it's the EIA sort of net product supplied uh, or consumption to end users. And, you know, we're in the first half of April, we're fluctuating around a 70% year over year decline in jet fuel uh, demand. Uh, just S&P's chief U.S. economist, we, we um, as a country, uh, have an exceeding the economic decline of the Great Recession in a much shorter period. So it's it's a combination, of course, the, the depth and the swiftness, uh, sharpest contraction in economic activity since World War II. Uh, they also think it'll be a slow, gradual recovery. And of course, one, one issue for us is uh, it's not just a matter of the number of passengers that's going to be the quality of traffic that translates into revenue. So 
what I'm saying there is basically we expect probably domestic leisure to come back the, the quickest and then um, some small business travel, uh, but corporate travel, which really, really is what funds our business, um, is probably going to be the last to return. There, there are fiscal considerations where they, of course, they slow hiring, they slow travel and entertainment, but also there will be sort of large scale um, HR legal liability concerns. They'll be hesitant to put their people on the road too quickly and in too great numbers. It's not just about the airplane. It's about staying in hotels and being in Ubers and, uh, you know, taking the subway, you know, all these sorts of things. Um, so just a little historical perspective, people ask, well, what happened in past, you know, crises and pandemics and such? Well, uh, post 9-11, it took about three and a half, four years for traffic and revenue to recover for us. People kind of forget it took that long. And from the global financial crisis, it was actually more than seven years to recover. Uh, if we go to uh, cargo, uh, it was a shorter time frame post 9-11. That was not nearly as pronounced an, an economic shock. The recession ended in November 2001. Uh, according to the National Bureau of Economic Research. But we had a much longer, of course, economic malaise post-global financial crisis. So in that case, it took 10 years for cargo volumes to recover. So how does that all translate into jet fuel? Well, the same sort of EIA data set I showed you before on a weekly basis, this is in broad annual terms, really since EIA started tracking jet fuel usage. Uh, and... Uh, we, we hit a peak in 2000 with a little over 1.7 million barrels per day of demand. And because of 9-11 and the Great Recession and, and the all just natural um, pressures to be more fuel efficient, it wasn't until last year, 2019, 19 years, uh, with all the growth we've had, um, uh, the popularity of air travel, the global economic growth for cargo and passengers to return to 2000 levels of U.S. demand. And of course, we will see a dramatically lower number in 2020. And, and just like the, and I think uh, we said that it'll take traffic a while to recome. It'll take re revenue a while to recover. I think it'll take even longer for fuel demand to recover because we'll be retiring disproportionately so many less fuel efficient airplanes and because the stuff that comes back last i think will be international you know wide body kind of long haul flying because of the traveler dynamic there and uh the dependency on the health of foreign countries as well so uh that is the end of my uh, prepared presentation and i'm i'm happy to turn it back to ryan or david and see if you have questions John, thanks so much. This is this is David. Um, as a reminder, if anyone has any questions for John, you can uh, post your questions in the attendee chat section or just simply email me at dholt at consumerenergyalliance.org and I'll ask John those questions. Uh, John, the first question I have is on slides, I think uh, 11 and 12, you talked about, you know, the economic implications of, uh, you know, climbing out of the, uh, the the situation they're in we're in there's for some there's going to be a psychological implication on just kind of a fear of being around people a fear of travel um, I just saw where Ron DeSantis uh, the governor of Florida was in the Oval Office with the president talking about the idea no one's actually proposed this but they were talking about the concept of testing foreign travelers as they board planes, uh, testing domestic travelers as they board planes just to maybe help alleviate some of the fear of travel. Um, they weren't talking about who would bear the cost of that, really, but just the, the psychological notion of all this. Have y'all started uh, thinking about that and thinking about ways that we can get business travelers back on planes again, uh, in addition to the economic implications here? Yeah, good question. Uh, ab absolutely. We've been uh, working with our members and just among our subject matter experts at uh, 
within A4A on a recovery plan? What's all the things that are necessary? Uh, safety, security, engineering, fueling, um, communications to get back up again. And um, that's in the works. And some of those will definitely entail cooperation with, with federal agencies and foreign entities. Uh, with respect to the for the federal government, you know, it's it's our it's our view that uh, any type of safety or security and personal health of the passenger, uh, certainly before they board the plane, is a government function. We already have a federalized screening workforce uh, to make sure um, no one who is a danger to another passenger or to a crew member gets through security. So we would say that um, if you're a danger because of public health or contagion, that would fall under the same bucket. And if it means getting um, supplemental appropriations of, of some sort for TSA, then we would advocate that. Um, nothing has been finalized. Um, those discussions are ongoing, uh, but we don't want anyone to get sick of course and we also want people to have the see the visible measures of i mean obviously we've been doing really stepped up our cleaning of the aircraft uh, delta on its earnings call said in the second quarter alone they expect uh, 200 million dollars in the quarter in incremental cleaning expenses so this isn't cheap uh, but we know it's a necessary uh, investment for public health and public confidence and People, many polls do show people will be hesitant um, to do certain types of activities unless they're confident in, in uh, cleanliness. And of course, you know, unlike a golf course where you can do social uh, distancing, uh, it's pretty hard to do that on an airplane. So we're going to have to make sure. And, and I think, you know, you may have seen uh, JetBlue this morning announced, or maybe it was last night, actually, they announced that um, they will require. Uh, passengers to to wear masks on the plane. Other carriers have said we will offer, we will have a mask you can use. So I, I suspect that will evolve as well. But as far as the screening function itself, we we hope the federal government will do that. And related to that, a question we're getting from uh, the audience here, you know, what what are the other airlines or what are the airlines talking about in addition to possibly screening and health screening and, and cooperation with the federal government? What are other things other than JetBlue and masks that you guys are talking about that would help give the public and the business community a little confidence and to, you know, prime the pump, if you will, to get people back on planes again? Are y'all talking about other kind of novel? Yeah, concepts? I mean, a, a big one is temperature checks uh, at the point of screening, probably at the security checkpoint is, is one that's clearly being discussed, uh, bounced, bounced about. Um uh, you know, possible um, accelerated use of technology at the checkpoint to reduce personal touch and contact. I know for sure that um, that's something TSA is looking at. Um, and the other one I, you know, I mentioned is the, the, you know, just intensified and frequent cleaning of our uh, common areas and lounges in the airports and, of course, the airplanes themselves. You know, there there was a, I don't know if they're still doing it, but in Dubai they were doing some kind of antibody test or blood test. And it's hard for me to imagine that the, the, the masses in America are going to accept that kind of, um, um, you know, screening. But I, I would not be surprised if they're accepting of, something less invasive, like a, a temperature check, especially if it's, um, you know, somewhat non-invasive with modern technology. Excellent. Um, and before I leave, I have a couple more questions that are popping in. Um, you, you mentioned conversations with TSA and others. Uh, what other conversations are the are A4A and some of the airlines having with the federal government about, you know, economic bailout, economic stimulus? I, I know that uh, we are looking at phase four of the recovery package, which may come in May at some point. Uh, I'm sure you're engaged in some in-depth conversations about, you know, getting the airline industry back on level footing. Yeah, I mean, at, at this point, we're not pursuing any 
additional sort of direct assistance or payroll support or anything like that. Um, we're pleased with, uh, I guess, CARES Act or three or phase three, what it's called. Um, what, what we are, you know, there may be some technical corrections and, and whatnot, but I think as far as substance, our focus would probably be um, if there is an, an, a large infrastructure component to phase four, then we would certainly want to weigh in. Um, it could be multi-product pipeline and storage tank related on the fuel side. It could be things related to uh, airports. It could be TSA type uh, infrastructure, air traffic control. So we we would want to get in there. And then, um, you know, there as you know, there's a large contingent that's interested in um, something climate related. So we would want to make sure we we shape that. Um, we do aspire to continue to, you know, improve our carbon footprint and our climate friendliness. And we would support um, research dollars or even transport infrastructure to ease uh, the the transport of sustainable aviation fuel from point of origin to an airport, which can be which can be a, a commercial barrier. So. Uh, I think generally, you know, infrastructure and climate is the short answer, David, to things we would probably be targeting in uh, with respect to phase four discussions. And be right before our call, we were kind of doing a little chat and we were talking about, uh, you know, the cargo aspect of a lot of the flights that your operators are running. Um, and there's ongoing discussion in the United States about, you know, U.S. supply chain and our reliance on uh, imported products like hand sanitizers and face masks and other things like that. Um, what are your guys doing to help, uh, you know, bring this needed cargo and just keep needed, you know, agriculture supply chains and, you know, basic necessities uh, to market? And, and obviously you're carrying a lot more cargo, I would think, from online purchasing and things like that. Yeah, definitely a very good question. And, and uh, both the, the passenger carriers and the cargo carriers, of course, playing a very active role in keeping uh, goods moving and whatever can be moved by plane. I think we're, we're generally doing it. As I said, we've, um, I mean, some airlines are flying in a cargo only configuration for the first time since the 40s or 50s. Uh, others have had freighter ops more recently in the past. Um, I think At Atlas, FedEx, and UPS have all had a direct participation in Project Airbridge. Uh, that, that includes transportation of, of masks and pharmaceuticals and uh, other other medical goods. But yeah, we're moving, you know, everything we've you know brought in uh, soybeans from Latin America, you know, and any um, food items. Um, so not too much. Historically, you know, between here and Latin America, it's been a big market for flowers. Same, of course, with Holland. Uh, not too much of that moving these days. But, uh, you know, food and medicine are, are big ones. And like I said, right now, 80% um, of our international flights are being flown in a cargo only configuration. Mm -hmm. uh, that's just for the passenger carriers. But we've got FedEx, UPS and, and Atlas right now that are moving a lot. What they've indicated is, yes, there's been a small uptick in e-commerce, but there's been a decline in business to business volumes, which tends to be the higher margin business. So that's one thing that's beset our cargo carriers a bit. And UPS actually reported this morning, just for the for first quarter, of course, we'll see most of this play out in the second and third quarter. Uh, but, but that's been an issue. So they, they're definitely playing an active role in helping supply chains where we can. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, another question from one of our listeners. Uh, when planes are retired, do those planes end up with other users or are they are the, those planes scrapped for parts? Yeah, well, the, the, what's unique here is that no one needs planes right now. So they're not going to other users because everyone's trying to get rid of planes. Um, you know, in some cases, a lessor will take one back. But in this case, where everyone's demand is down and the manufacturers and the lessors are up the creek as well, um, we're seeing either temporary storage, um, which is different than retirement. I mean, so temporary storage in some airports, you're actually having entire runways 
not being used for active operations and instead they're being used with airplanes lined up in a parked configuration, tailed it wing to wing. Um, they could be parked in hangars. They could be parked in sites in, uh, you know, off airport sites in, in uh, Arizona or uh, California and whatnot. Um, but then, then there's um, also the true accelerated retirement. Uh, you know, so Delta said they're they're going to retire all their um, last of their MD-88s, MD-90s, uh, I think by July instead of the end of the year. They're, they and American are going to accelerate retirements, 757, 767. So in those cases, um, I think from in most of those tails, uh, aircraft tails, they will be parted out and scrapped. It's just we're in suppressed, depressed demand for a while. And you see planes that are of a that ordinarily would have you know maybe ten more years of useful economic life that don't never take off again. Um, mm. So there, you know, it's a mixture. But I think you're going to see a lot of accelerated uh, sort of premature aircraft retirements here. Goodness. Well, John, thank you so much for this. Uh... You know, eye-opening, really good, honest, frontline discussion here of, you know, what the airline industry is going through. Godspeed to you, uh, all the critical workers, the pilots and the flight attendants who are kind of frontline uh, facing, you know, the, the coronavirus on a daily basis. But thanks for all you do. And here's to a speedy recovery. Um, I, I want to turn it over to Michael Zayer here just for a quick minute on you know federal recovery efforts what we should expect in phase four as it relates to some of the things that john talked about uh supply chain things other critical industry initiatives that you're looking at and uh, then i'll come back for a, a closing thought so zare the floor is yours sure just briefly um next week the senate will be coming back in the house looks like they may take another week before they come back when they return We'll be looking at a phase four package. Um, right now, there are difference of, of opinion about uh, whether or not they need one immediately. Um, the big sticking point right now is assistance to states and, and local governments um, in some kind of package um, that would be less of a rescue package and more of a recovery package that would include some infrastructure. Um, we know that there are a lot of our members right now in different associations that would very much like to see infrastructure and, and energy infrastructure included. Um, we're also looking at a number of provisions to help out some of the struggling oil and gas producers. We're looking at provisions that are that are uh, supported by the renewable uh, industries, both wind and solar, um, looking to promote all of the above. We think that um, energy infrastructure, energy development, whether it's traditional fuels or, or renewables, all have the, the ability to ramp up rapidly and provide employment opportunities um, while providing um, a, a more robust and, and more resilient um, grid and infrastructure uh, for consumers down the road. So we're watching all of that. We're not sure how that's going to turn out. Um, other things that we're looking at are the uh, are the funding mechanisms for, for PPP and how that might be broadened out to allow for a few more uh, small businesses uh, to gain access to it based on their, their ownership structures. Um, we're also very interested in the, the Main Street uh, lending program through Fed um, and how that might be able to be accessed by some of our struggling energy companies and energy service providers um, to access those funds as well. So we'll be looking at those. And then for anybody who has recommendations or policies or your, your either business or your association is putting forward recommendations um, for the administration or, or for Congress, uh, please let us know. We'd be happy to amplify those or include those in our communications with the Hill and to the administration as well. But uh, a lot is up in the air right now, but um, it looks like there will be at least one more large package to get the, the U.S. economy back on, on stable footing and, and help us grow out of this thing. I'll turn it back to you, Dave. Yeah, thank you, Michael. Um, and, and John, thanks again for all your comments. We really appreciate you taking the time to join our, our, uh, our webinar here. Uh, thanks for all the folks who called in today and for the questions. And again, John Heimlich, Vice President and Chief Economist for Airlines for America. Really, really appreciate your time and your presentation today. Thank you. It's a pleasure.